work at AIG, and for those of you who don't know, AIG is a leading insurance provider. Um, they have footprint in, I think, more than 80 countries, uh, close to $50 billion in revenue, uh, uh, and you know, about 50,000 employees in the ballpark. So uh, it's a big insurance company. And what I'm going to talk to you today is um, how are we approaching process improvement um, and process redesign um, and process design um, within our, our company. And what we call it internally is process wind tunnel. And the, I'll give you a little bit of motivation why we call it process wind tunnel. I mean, if you look at um, aircrafts or high-speed race cars, uh, how are they designed? You don't necessarily just put the parts together and expect to get uh, outstanding performance. Uh, you build what is called a wind tunnel, uh, where you build these prototypes, you test it, you look at the, what the drag is, what the lift is, you optimize it basically using a lot of data. And then through that, um, you finally make the decision to go into manufacturing. Now, when you look at how business processes are designed, uh, especially uh, at least in, uh, in the financial and the insurance industry, uh, the focus is more on feasibility. So let's say you want to design a process to write insurance policies. Uh, and it starts on one, let's say, with the brokers or the agents, and the other end, you have the final policy that has to be delivered. So there's a lot of data that needs to be captured, a lot of risks that need to be evaluated, a lot of modeling that needs to be done, um, and then you know, a lot of interactions with legal, with customers, with uh, internal IT people, uh, and all these happen. So people try to focus on how do we put these systems together, um, and the focus really is to get it to all work. So at the end, when the underwriters uh, are writing the policies, they are able to create the policies, right? They write policies. So in the language of optimization, it's really looking at feasibility. You're trying to get a feasible solution, not necessarily an optimal solution. Now, people, when they design it, don't, they may not think like that. They're probably thinking, you know, they're using their experience. They're trying to see, you know, I'm, you know, this is how we have done it. This is what we know from before. So when they put all these things together, they think that they have created an optimal solution. But the real reality is that that's not really the case. So what we are saying is, okay, if, if you're drawing by the analogy from the wind tunnel in the race car industry or the um, aircraft industry, you know, we want to build a similar kind of framework, and that's why we are calling it the process wind tunnel. So, so again, as I said, it's a, it's a virtual modeling and analysis framework uh, coupled with a set of toolkit um, and, and software to evaluate and optimize business processes, uh, which includes both the structure of the process, the parameters of the process, and we really want to leverage as much as possible real-world data in doing so. So that before we have actually committed to the final process design, we have done our optimization very much like we do in wind tunnels. So again, there are really four phases um, in, this, in this framework. Uh, so first is uh, we, we have to deal with the data, right? So, so it comes, a lot of the data today in these systems is being captured by IT systems. So we work very closely with the IT systems to get the data. Of course, there are the business process rules and constraints, the process maps uh, that we need to understand. And then um, we also need information around you know, other things like people, facility, and systems, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the broad uh, class of data that we, we work with. Um, once we have gathered the data, then we go through uh, an intense uh, phase of data wrangling, which is really slicing and dicing the data, preparing it for analysis of various kinds. Uh, we utilize statistical analysis and visualization tools to get insights into what's going on with the process. And also, very, um, <clears throat> uh, in many cases today, we have event log data, right, which really makes it uh, very rich. And you can utilize process mining very effectively. And I'll give you an example uh, where we'll, we'll show how we have utilized um, these, um, these techniques and tools. So, the, the, uh, the end goal of this second phase is to establish a baseline. Okay, this is how things are today, uh, both in terms of cost and in terms of performance metrics. Once we have done that, then we build a simulation model. And in this case, I'll be talking about discrete simulation models, again, driven by the uh, analysis that we have done in the, in the second phase, which is using process mining and statistical analysis. Um, and we build simulation models, which then becomes our virtual test bed where we can start 
doing a lot of virtual experimentation, scenario analysis, what if design, optimization studies to come up with recommendations. Now, in the third phase, uh, there is also a lot of science that is used. You know, when, when we talk about, you know, how do you schedule work? You know, uh, what kind of distributions do you have? Um, how do you do actually simulation optimization? Now, um, 15 years ago, um, if you said, I want to do simulation optimization, in theory it was possible, but the amount of time it will take you to perform some of these analysis, simulation optimization, will be, you know, would have been days, maybe even months. But nowadays with multi-core processors, uh, you know, faster machines, you know, uh, better algorithms, uh, there's been a lot of research done in simulation optimization also. Uh, these things have become feasible. So it seems like, you know, a lot of these forces, you know, are converging. Uh, process binding, very powerful technology, but maybe we didn't have the data 10 years ago. But today, a lot, at least I have seen a um, um, lot of this data has now become available. So process mining is becoming a really very powerful uh, reality now. Similarly, simulation optimization is the same case. Visualization tools have evolved. So the convergence of a lot of these technologies, I think, is what makes it possible to build something like a process wind tunnel. And then, of course, once you have your recommendations, um, because it's all driven by quantitative analysis, you can also project, right? So you can say, if I make this change, I will get 20% improvement in my performance. So there is that predictive power that you bring to the table, which makes it, uh, you know, something you can discuss with the operations or with the uh, process owners and say, okay, is it worth making the change? You can do a cost-benefit analysis. And then you go into implementation, which means uh, running pilots, you know, uh, sometimes you may have to make system changes, um, you know, maybe some new tools might be required. And... Uh, uh, and then if there is some resistance, which always there is in big operations, there will be some issues regarding change management. But we, we won't talk m as much about those things here. You know, I'll keep my talk focused more, mostly on the first three phases uh, today. So again, there are, these are the four phases. We have data collection, uh, current state analysis, have we got future state design, and then implementation. So what is our ultimate goal? I mean, we have to... In, to do any such project, we have to sell it internally, right, in, in the company. So our objective really is to improve profits through transformation of process design and management. So how is it done today? And how is it, what we are proposing, how is it different? I mean, for you, some of it may be re repeat, but I just want to kind of go over it, at least the way I have seen it in the insurance industry. A lot of these process changes are constantly being made. There are process consultants, internal teams that are doing this. But a lot of it is being done uh, qualitatively. So that what I would call the traditional approach is people talk to the process owners, sit down with them, do the process mapping, understand the pain points, understand the bottlenecks, uh, sit down in a room, debate and say, okay, where should we make the changes? And then we make those changes. So it's, it's more qualitative and of course it takes a lot of time, a lot of people. What we are proposing here is using some of these tools that I just discussed briefly. Uh, <clears throat> what we postulate is that it, will, it can be done faster. Uh, it's more data-driven. It can be done with less people, far less people. And, um, uh, and as I said, it has some of the benefits of being far more predictive and you can do some accurate predictions um, and make better decisions. So what I will do is, you know, I'll try to illustrate this project, uh, process wind tunnel methodology using one example, uh, again, uh, from the insurance industry, uh, from within AIG. So what I looked, I'm going to talk today about is the policy underwriting process. Um, and our goal is to improve the operational efficiency and the business results. Uh, and then we will do this and see, you know, can this be something that be, can be expanded to a larger class of policy underwriting process? So again, a, 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 from, a stand, from a performance standpoint, we will be looking at uh, how can we reduce the cycle time? How can we increase the capacity? So we have a team of underwriters who are currently writing policies, and they're taking a certain amount of time to do so. From the point the broker contacts to the point the broker gets the policy in hand, there is a certain amount of time. We want to shrink that as much as possible. We want the same team to be able to address a higher volume. So that's the capacity issue. Uh, and then there are some issues with customer satisfaction. Now, from a performance standpoint, you know, some people might argue that you know, in the insurance world there are other metrics that are important, like you don't want to degrade risk, because risk is a very important metric. Now, those things we are not going to cover in this particular um, talk, but, uh, and I'll just focus on most basically reduce cycle time and increase capacity. Um, and the idea is if you can increase capacity, we can probably capture more premium, uh, we can reduce cycle time so we can become more competitive, 
uh, and uh, by improving business performance. Um, and this will overall lead to an improved business performance. Uh, the technologies are what I just discussed, process data analytics, process mining, descriptive and simulation. So the process I'll be talking to you about, as I said, is the insurance underwriting process. And if you look at a high level, uh, it starts with a, bro uh, with a broker contacting, now this is from the commercial space, in the life and retirement space or the consumer space, you know, it might be slightly different. Uh, the, the person may directly contact, but here we are talking about the commercial, uh, commercial insurance policies. Um, and so a submission, let's say, is entered, and it could be via an email or a broker calls an underwriter. Um, the underwriter will gather some preliminary information. There are IT systems that are used, some templates that they use to collect all the information. And that's what's listed here. Um, then they will um, process all that information, evaluate the risk, and come up with some estimate of premium um, and, and claims and so on and so forth, the terms and conditions of the policy. Uh, that quote is sent back to the uh, broker. Uh, the court will either get accepted or declined. There may be some negotiation also, um, but if it gets declined, the process ends. But if it gets accepted, then it goes through a phase which is called binding, which means now the policy becomes part of the portfolio of the company's uh, policies. That's uh, binding, and there are some steps involved there. Then, the, then it goes through booking, which means you're, you're actually entering all the premium into the financial system, so there are some, some process-related uh, constructs there. And finally, the process, uh, policy getting issued, which is uh, either it could be a paper um, document that gets mailed out or a PDF document that gets mailed out. Now, the way this process is, the one that I'm talking about was um, executed was not by a single team. So this is a multi-site effort. So there was, uh, this is from one of the countries. Um, so the broker resides in the country, the underwriters are in that country. There is an ops team within the country, an IT team that's supporting these brokers. Then there are two offshore teams, uh, primarily for cost uh, reasons, that do some of the more uh, administrative type of work and support work. So there are really four or five teams that are working. So each of these blocks are not being done by the, <coughs> by the same people. It's being done by different sets of people. Again, there are three, broadly speaking, there are three kinds of policies these underwriters are working on. So one is absolutely new business. So this is the first time uh, a client has approached the company, so that's, um, that's the new business. Uh, then you have renewals, which means you have an existing policy and uh, it has got to be renewed. Uh, and the final third class is what is called, what we call internally midterm adjustments, which means you have a policy and you want to make changes to the policy. So, so those are the three broad class of policies and each one has its own process map. Um, so again, going back to our process wind tunnel approach and our data-driven approach, we start with, um, with capturing the data. And again, these, this data comes from multiple systems. So we have to work with the IT teams, and we worked with them and we got the data. We fused it to, uh, to get more of the relevant data set. And here's an example. So for the new business, um, you can think of it like a big, large CSV file or spreadsheet. It had 109 columns. Um, and this is one year data. We had 4,510 records. Uh, 117 columns for the renewal, 6,651 uh, 6, records. And 46 attributes for the midterm adjustments and about 11,000 records, right? Now, if you look at uh, this data, as I said, um, this has a lot of business information and as well as event information. So if you look at the third one in particular, um, you can see that it has pretty much all the constructs that you need for process mining. So you have the ID, which is the first column. You have the dates, the creation date and the result date. The login team is the group that's working on it. And the queue is the actual activity. So that's what uh, internally the system calls the queue. So you have all the information that you need to actually do the process mining. And similarly, you have the information in the other two, um, under two, other two data sets also. So first step, as I said, is you know, trying to, we try to do some just uh, st uh, statistical analysis and visualization, just try to get a sense of you know, what is going on in this, in this process. So things like you know, the very first one says, okay, what are the different kinds of, even within, let's say, new business, what are the different kind of products you, mixes you have? Because even within that, there is a lot of variability. You know, which ones are the dominant products? How does the demand vary by, um, by, uh, by month? And like this operation we were looking at, um, because of the nature of when stuff uh, needs to be bound, um, the, third, the fourth quarter was the busiest, right? So a lot of the work was, all policy work was happening in the fourth quarter. Um, we can certainly look at the 
turnaround time distribution, so those five phases that I, uh, six phases that I talked about, you know, where is the work flowing, how, how, where does it spend most of the time. Um, we can look at, um, uh, certainly do the process mining to figure out where the bottlenecks are happening. I'll show you some more examples of that. Uh, we also found that, you know, because there are multiple teams, uh, things are, are being handed off, right? So it goes from one team to the other and then back and forth. And one of the things we found is every time there was a handoff, you know, there were, you know, there were at least three or four days getting added to your cycle time. Uh, so those kind of things you can uh, extract from your process mining. Uh, you can also see w which of these teams is actually doing most of the work uh, and where are the queues happening. So for example, when we looked at um, the, uh, this was the MTA process, and we, we interviewed the people and we said, okay, there were some issues. The operation felt they were taking too long to do the midterm adjustments. And so we interviewed the various teams and the people and said, where do you think you know, is your problem using the qualitative approach? And they said, it's actually in the downstream process. That's where it's getting held up. Well, when we did the process mining using the data that we saw, we found it was actually uh, not in the downstream process, but it was actually with, uh, with one of the teams that, um, that did not think that the problem was. Now, of course, when you read the diagnostics, we realized that you know, it was one of the lowest priority work for them, and they were, they were de delaying it, and as a result, you know, the, the overall cycle time was on. Now, so process mining you know, just gave you that, that very quantitative view, and because it was an end-to-end -end with multiple countries involved, nobody really had a good sense of exactly what was happening, but with this data-driven approach and applying uh, these, these kind of techniques, we were able to very quickly pinpoint where the issues were. Um, now, what we did was, as I said, we, uh, I showed you some, some examples of you know, how we went through and established the baseline metrics. And we spent the whole day with the um, ops team, and we shared all the findings with them, and we got consensus that, yes, you know, we, we think we, we have identified some, some several issues. Now the question is, how do you improve it, right? So yes, I have long cycle times, I have delays. How do you improve them? Um, because that's where your real, um, the benefit of this, this work is. So what we do is we now move to the third phase, which is how do we design the future state? And the primary tool that we will be using here is discrete event simulation. So it's really a, a modeling technique for these processes. But what we are doing is we are going to, those, those models will be very informed by a lot of the analysis that we did, the process mining work that we did in, in this phase. So now we are shifting gears. We are now moving from collecting data, analyzing data, to building the simulation models. So, when you're building a simulation model, there are you know, certain constructs. You first need to know what the structure of the model is. And a model is always a representation of reality, right? So there is not one unique model that describes a simulation model that describes a process. And the, the previous step, you already have a good sense of what are the main questions you're trying to answer, right? In this case, I said I'm gonna answer the turnaround time. I'm gonna focus on turnaround time and utilization of resources. So my models have to be able to address that, right? So, so even though there'll be an approximation and maybe they are not able to address some other aspect, but for, the, for, for these two questions, my model has to be uh, correct. So what we do is, you know, we looked at the um, process mining, you know, it gives you all the um, uh, connectivities between the different steps. It tells you, you know, which steps are um, more dominant pathways. It tells you, uh, where the rework loops are, are happening, what percentage goes where. So if you, have, if you have some experience in building these discrete event simulation models, you know, there is an input source that drives the model. Uh, and then there is various steps. There is a connection between the various steps. So you need to characterize each step. So let's say if you are doing um, some, some task uh, associated with uh, evaluating the risk of the data. So, you, so it's not going to be one single number, right? It's a distribution, typically, depending on the complexity of the work. So those kinds of things you can get from, from this model. Again, you know, what granularity do you want to build the model? Of course, you don't want to capture every little event that a person or a system is doing. So what is the granularity that you want to capture? Again, very aligned with uh, what uh, process mining helps you with. Um, so what I'm trying to say is when we do the process mining, it's, it's not something as of at least the, the way I see the technology today, it's not something that you can push a button and get a simulation model. Right? Unless you have a very structured simulation model or a, that you actually know what you're, what you're trying to do. So a lot of it is, you know, you do the process mining, you extract information, then you manually move it 
that those uh, that data and those constructs into your simulation model. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to see if that can be automated as, as the field evolves. Um, then processing and distributions, transition probability. So let's say stuff comes into a point and then it forks and goes to three different places. You want to know, you know what percentage is going where. So all those things very readily come out of a process mining uh, analysis. So, so we, we used that data, we used the, um, uh, the knowledge that we get, gathered working with the business people, and we built the simulation model. The, another point I would like to mention um, is in the services world, um, unlike maybe very tightly manufacturing, you know, product manufacturing type environments, when you look at the performance metrics, uh, they're typically very non-normal. In fact, in the services world, um, at least all the data I have seen, it's not just non-normal, these are long tail distributions. So an example you can see here is, if you look at turnaround time uh, for the policy, right? Um, you can see that, um, um, or, or some step within that, that policy, you can see that the mean is 11 hours and the median is one hour, right? So, and if you look at the, the tail of the distribution, it's pretty long. And guess where, uh, guess what? The place where people uh, face, get the most phone calls of the most disgruntled customers are those that fall in the tail. Because if you say, you know, I can do things in one hour, but if, if it's going to take you the maximum, say, 144 hours or 90 hours, right? I mean, those customers are going to be really annoyed. Um, so when you're trying to redesign your process or optimize your process, uh, uh, if you just take the traditional view and say, I'm going to optimize my mean, that may not be sufficient. You need to look at not just the mean, mean value, but also some measure of the tail performance. And again, as I was mentioning earlier, um, there has been a lot of work done in what goes in this literature as tail scheduling. And it, it doesn't come from this, uh, maybe there is some, some people in this community doing it, but a lot of it comes from the distributed computing world. Uh, multi-server processing, where people have, do, uh, have addressed this issue of how do you uh, do scheduling in the presence of these long tails. And I have given an example here. Um, this is a paper by Adam Weirman, who's a professor at Caltech. Um, and he's done a lot of pioneering work in this area. Um, you can, you know, it, it's, it, it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, papers have been written in this area. But you can, you can see there are some very fundamental questions you have to answer. You know, you have to look at not just the mean performance as well as the tail performance. Uh, you have to understand what is the nature of the distribution, as well as um, you also need to look at um, fairness, right? So when you're scheduling work, you might be able to give, get improved uh, cycle times, but are you being fair to your clients? Because um, you know, people who send work earlier, let's say, they might expect an earlier response, things of that nature. And how can you trade off these things? So it's a, it's a well-developed science. I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done here, but. Uh, certainly something to keep in mind as we redesign our systems. So again, when, when you look at your process mining, I mean, we use Disco. Um, uh, when you use process mining, one thing, you know, it gives you, at every queue, it gives you mean and median, right? So one very quick rule of thumb is, if you see a big gap between the mean and the median values, you know that, you know, there are, there are a lot of long tail type phenomena in your process. Um, and, uh, and these are not outliers. So this is not what Lean Six Sigma would call just a special cause of variation, right? It's a, it is some, something fundamentally inherent in the process. So you can't just consider it an outlier and throw it. So I thought I'll bring this up because this is a very critical part of our process redesign also. So uh, going back to our example, uh, we had three classes of uh, work. One was new business, the other was renewal, and the third one was MTA. Um, and what we did was we built the simulation models, you know, populated the parameters and the uh, structure um, using the analysis for the previous phase. Uh, and then it becomes your test bed to run a lot of what-if scenarios. So you can test a wide range of uh, scheduling policies, you can test a wide range of uh, structural uh, changes, you can do formal simulation optimization on resources, you know, a variety of things. And, and we went through all, that, the, all those phases, and finally we found that there was one class of uh, operating policies that was giving a huge impact, almost 50% improvement in cycle times, um, which was when we, when we ran it, it, you know, we ran it a few times to make sure that, you know, that was indeed the case. And then when we found that, we went and shared it with the ops team. And the only way to vet it, of course, it was a little, uh, I mean, not everybody was ready to believe it. Um, but uh, when we said, okay, so let's run a pilot, 
right? So let's pilot this, this policy and these process changes to see what we actually get. So we ran a two-month pilot. Uh, we had to make some, as I was saying, we had to make some system changes. We had to add some um, new tools because one of the things we were changing is uh, how the work was getting prioritized. Uh, so as you said, you know, these, these people um, had about 3,000 policies in the busy period in their, in their uh, bucket. Um, and there was a, this was a, a team of underwriters, so we couldn't just say, hey, use this policy. We had to give them a, a tool that could actually tell them what to work on when, uh, depending on, uh, on the state of the various queues. So we built that tool, which would, what it would do is you know, it would pull all the, all the data every day morning, uh, we would um, basically populate a spreadsheet, send it to all the underwriters, so they had a, a structured way of processing it. Um, and we had some change management issues because typically underwriters uh, have to work with, you know, their concern was what if a broker calls me and what, are you telling me that, you know, we shouldn't work uh, in this order, or we should just stick to your order. So there were those kinds of things we had to work through. Um, um, uh, there was some, of course, there was some concern about, you know, this was their busy period that they might miss on some of the revenues and things of that nature. But anyway, we, we, we worked through all of those. We had uh, the commitment of, uh, of their, um, uh, their COO. Uh, we pushed the pilot. It, it, it ran for two months. And as you can see, the results were uh, what we had predicted. I mean, their cycle times would drop dramatically. Their productivity shot up. Um, and, and so this was a, a clear case that, you know, I mean, it, and again, we are not, we are not shooting to um, hit the numbers. Like, if I say 15 days and my model says, let's say, three days, you know, uh, the pilot has to hit three days. I mean, we, we are looking for significant improvements, which we, which we got. And then the, the last piece, the way we close the loop is, now that we, we were monitoring the pilot, um, we, can, we started collecting event data from the pilot. And this data was actually richer than what was even being collected originally because we knew that you know, we, could, um, we could process mine it. So we collected the data, and then we were able to use that new data, process mine it, and see, okay, this is how it was before, this is how it's now, and we could do a before and after. So process mining was not only used to gain insights, uh, drive the improvements uh, in the simulation model, but post-implementation, you could use the same technique to compare before and after, which makes it sort of, you know, you're comparing apples to apples. So that brings me um, to the end of my talk. I, we have applied this. I gave you one example, which was the policy underwriting. We have worked with other processes, uh, claims. We have worked with uh, catastrophic modeling. We have worked with a wide range of, uh, you know, several other processes, also in the consumer space. And we are seeing, you know, very significant uh, opportunities to improve productivity. Um, I think um, prior to um, uh, joining AIG, I was uh, with Xerox for many years, where we built, um, we followed similar ideas, uh, but more focused on, on the printing space. And there we were able to create a toolkit uh, that could scale across that class of processes. So here um, I can see, you know, we could probably build similar kind of um, so it won't be a process wind tunnel for the entire insurance industry. I don't think that because there are a lot, with, even within insurance, there is a lot of uh, variability, but maybe we can classify it and create uh, subsets uh, of class of processes where we can build like a wind tunnel for this class of process, a wind tunnel for that kind of process. But uh, I think given the fact that there is a huge uh, opportunity to improve productivity across a large class of business processes, I think this methodology We'll continue to work on it and see, you know, how far we can we can take it. So I'll be happy to answer any question. I'll start off with the first question. Now, um, simulation has been around for even yeah quite a, quite some longer time compared to process mining, so maybe 10, 20 years longer. Uh, and um, so it was always a little bit of a question also why it's not used more, right? People have simulation tools are there, and uh, one of the things that then once process mining came up was was the idea. Okay, one of the big challenges of simulation is that you exactly you don't have this um, the accurate as is starting point based on which you can start creating your what if. Uh, simulation mm -hmm. models. So process mining can really help there, and yes. I think your talk is a really nice demonstration of how it can work together. Um, at the same time, I see 
uh, I, I would have expected, over looking over the past years, that more people working in the prosthetic space would actually combine it with simulation. And I, I have to say, I don't see it that much. So I'm wondering what, what your idea is. Maybe I, th I was thinking one reason could be that doing simulation right still is quite challenging and you have to get things right, like the distributions, the scheduling, simulating um, human behavior is quite difficult, right? Do you think that these are the reasons that people don't really know how to do this or you see other reasons for that? Yes, I mean, simulation is uh, very specialized. Uh, it requires very specialized uh, skills. Yeah. And uh, even though there are a lot of tools for simulation, they are really programming environments. Mm. So when you say, you know, I have any logic or I have Arena or whatever, um, these are, they have nice visual interfaces, but you have to actually go and program it. It's, visual, it's literally visual programming. And so you need very high levels of skills uh, involved. Um, so I think in certain areas like semiconductor manufacturing and others, simulation has been used very uh, effectively. Uh, in the banking and insurance industry, at least based on what I have seen, um, certainly not to that extent. Um, part of it is, as you said, you know, um, it's, it's hard and until you can tie it with the data and sort of one of the, one of the I don't know if I, if I mentioned it, but when you build a simulation model, uh, after you've built it, the first thing is to, what I call it, you know, tune it to make sure that the baseline model matches results, matches with what the real data is. Now, that's not easy. Uh, that's actually quite hard. But that's where, you know, things like process mining and stuff where you have very deep insights into the cues and some, some of the structural uh, of the process helps you. So I, I wouldn't say that, you know, we have still reached a place where, where this is suddenly going to, like, maybe the, as we call it, the tipping point. Uh, it still requires, as you see, a lot of skills. But the more we can understand it and build it, as I said, when I was, I was at Xerox, I built a similar system for the printing industry where we were able to seamlessly build the simulation model and do some of the analysis uh, just from data. But that was only applicable to a certain class of processes. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it is, uh, I think the challenges are still there. But as I said, a lot of these forces, the way I see it as, you know, these, the four technologies that I mentioned are converging, you know, and I think, you know, we will get there. It's, it's just, uh, you know, when it's hard to predict, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. We have a question yes. over there, yes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I thought it was very interesting for us because we also want to look into simulation, but what I don't know or what I'm wondering about now is whether I should do simulation of processes or whether I should predict processes and sort of have an anomaly detection uh, and predict if this process is going to be out of the KPI or if this process is going to go, going to end unsuccessful, for example, based on its previous pattern. So could you explain some about that? Can you repeat the question? So you said you'd want to do simulation or prediction? I yeah, think simulation yeah. is used for prediction, right? Okay. So you build the simulation model. Yeah. You make sure that your parameters are such that the, it matches what you're seeing in the baseline. And then that becomes your test bed for, for predicting future performance. So it's actually the same? Predicting, predicting and simulating the model? Yeah. I mean, you use the simulation model for prediction. Okay. Uh, well, maybe just to, to add one thing there, I think, looking at your question, um, one difference that we see is that when you're looking at simulation, you're really looking at alternative uh, processes, alternative what-if scenarios. You could change something in the, in the process, doing it in one way, or you could make a different change, which would change the process in a different way. But before you make the actual change in the real process, you're doing it in the simulation model yes. to evaluate, for example, with the different scheduling uh, strategies, they were evaluated, okay, one of the scheduling strategies has better, better results. So then you choose, okay, this is the one, the improvement we are going to make, and then you put it into practice. And with prediction, it's often more like you want to know for a running case, well, when will this case be finished? Or is this running the risk of being late or something? But it's about the actual process. It's not evaluating what if alternatives. So maybe that's one yeah. difference you could you could add. Thanks. Okay, we have a question over there. It's automatic. Maybe if you speak, try. Okay. 
Oh, great. So, uh, great presentation again. Uh, have you thought about applying this to marketing analytics? I know that in marketing, mixed modeling, and in multi-touch attribution, all these methodologies combined, and potentially uh, process mining as well, is uh, kind of almost their bread and butter. I haven't done anything yet. Um, we certainly, um, as I said, you know, for the past three years within AIG, and uh, what we've been trying to do is you know, target different segments. Um, what you mentioned, we haven't yet uh, looked at, but it sounds like an interesting idea. We'll, uh, we will probably you know, get there, but so far, no, we haven't done that. More questions for Sudendu over there? Yes. Yeah, so thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, I, I like the wind tunnel metaphor, and I think it's also very important that process mining is always also forward-looking, because you can only uh, have a return on investment if you change something. So, so I think that's very important. But I would like to follow a bit upon what Anne said uh, before. Uh, uh, so have, having done uh, this type of thing myself, it's very difficult to get simulation models to behave like reality. So one of the things is, for example, that if you have a certain time in your process mining analysis, let's say it takes five days, then it is not so clear if you, I don't know, if you send one request, it may be five days. If you send two requests, is it then still five days? Or is it 10 days? Yeah, so sometimes if you overload the department with things, like you look at the sum of times, but sometimes, I don't know, if I mail a letter, it always takes two days, mm -hmm. independent of how many letters I send. And I think, uh, to come to, to my question, these phenomena uh, make uh, uh, the power of process mining is that you, are all, you show facts and they are undisputable. If you do simulation, you get these like, assumptions that are in your model. So I think validation is very important. Yes. Can, can you tell more about the validation process and perhaps also that sometimes you want to show afterwards that your simulation model was correct, even if so, you could not show it before. So, you, you're absolutely right. So, in simulation, we deal with distributions, right? So, you don't have, uh, even though I said average is 15 days, it's, it's a distribution which has average, there's a standard deviation, there are other moments of that distribution. Now, but, ideally... But, but what I mean is that other than the shape of the distribution, the distribution will also be will also change if you feed it with more with with, with more data. I like yeah, it's it's like you can have like a clear queuing system. Yes. Or something that is not so sensitive how much work you put into it. Yes, absolutely right. So I mean those queuing uh, res, uh, queuing um, phenomena um, are are there in that simulation model. What we do is you know we run it with actual data. So instead of trying to fit, so we bootstrap from, from the actual data to run the simulation model, which is we take whatever is the distribution. Um, of course, you could, do, you could take the data, which is how traditionally simulation is done. You look at the data, you fit a distribution, and then use that parametric distribution to drive the simulation. What we do is we just take the raw data, and we just bootstrap from that. So, so some of the things what you're saying is captured in that. I mean, I think people in the simulation world you might be aware, are calling it trace-based simulation. It's sort of the new name for, for that kind of simulation. So it's kind of trace-based simulation. Now, but still, that, it doesn't uh, solve the problem that you have a distribution and you'll never get a perfect fit. So I could probably match the mean, but maybe a stand, my standard deviation may not be right. I might be able to match the standard deviation. My third moment may be wrong. My, my kurtosis may be wrong. So typically what I have done um, is I have definitely tried to match the mean and try to get the standard deviation of the two distributions right. Um, beyond that, you know, we don't necessarily look at it. So if you look at the predicted simulation model versus the real data when I said you have to match it, it doesn't fall like one on top of the other. We try to make sure that the mean and standard deviation are matched up to some error, and then we go with that. Um, so, yes, uh, I mean, validation is a hard part, uh, and I know if you look at some of the scheduling literature I talked about, you know, people talk about nth moment validation and things and like that, which would be the perfect thing, but um, I think it's good enough to get first two, first two moments matched up. 
but it could also be that the simulation itself is like a learning process where you see that your simulation, in hindsight, you see that your simulation, you say the simulation, you should do this and this and this. And then you do it in reality and then it turns out to be something completely different that you have a feedback loop there. Yes, so. yes. So if, if uh, I mean, if in case, let's say we make a prediction that, you know, these are changes, you, the adversity will turn and you'll get so much, and if it turns out that that's not really the case, and if the gap is too high, that means something was wrong in the model. So you can come back and, and fix the model. And that actually goes to your question, you know, why is simulation not, because it's not, a, it's not at a push button level. So anything to proliferate, you know, you have to get it to as much as a push button level. But here there is a lot of insights and decision making that's involved in this, in this iterative process. The thing I'm seeing is, um, is when you take these end-to-end -end views, um, and you start putting the whole thing together into one uh, and then apply what I just went through, the, the opportunity is very significant. So even let's say you know, we are a little bit off in terms of the uh, actual numbers, um, the, we can still um, capture a lot. And, and all the issues you're bringing up are very real. I mean, it, the whole idea of you know, <clears throat> using simulation to uh, predict real-world performance. That, that, just that problem itself is, you know, still a, is a difficult one. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. We have time for one more question over there. Yeah, I'll be uh, real quick. Uh, thanks for your... I'm over here. <laughs> thanks for your uh, presentation. Uh, I was wondering what tool are you using or tools for um, simulation? So we use AnyLogic. Okay. Um, for process mining, we use Disco. And for all our statistical analysis and visualization, we use Jump. Thank you. Sure. Great. Let's thank Sudendo again.